Hello folks, time for another philosophical video and this one's rather touchy. We're going to be talking about religion. <laughs> Not religion per se, and I don't use this in a negative way, but maybe I should rephrase this. Um, it's that, myself included, we often have these uh, deeply held beliefs that sometimes prevent us from progressing and that's what I want to talk about in this video it's another philosophical video of course and I know that <laughs> in the world of McDonald's fast consumption videos like these are just not popular at all but what motivates me to make some of these videos sometimes I get emails from some people somewhere in the world who tell me that my videos helped a lot that really touches my heart that I that I can positively influence maybe at least even just one of you out there and you see results after implementing some of uh, the advice I give so yeah talking about these deeply held beliefs and I myself am a victim of this and the best thing I was able to do for myself uh, at one point in my life is to question these long-held beliefs why do we have these long-held beliefs it's often a result of standardization and education um and then sometimes also this kind of fear of letting go because we were taught this way from such an early age and we held this to be true for so long that it feels like our world is kind of torn apart if we can admit that maybe it wasn't as accurate as we were led to believe so there's the fear aspect of these things as well what has changed a lot for me as have someone who has been involved with music education for 20 plus years is at the beginning I taught the same way as everyone else did I repeated what I was taught what I had read what I didn't question believed to be true and now 20 years 20 plus years later all the life experiences I've had a unique set of circumstances that allowed me to work with super high profile musicians and being able to pick their brain and then formulating my own thoughts um, what's changed is that the more I know the more I realize how little I know and how difficult it is to teach because if you think about it teaching I just have to transfer knowledge right but the difficulty is um, well, maybe not the difficult what's especially changed nowadays is that when I teach not that I teach very often anymore it's usually these kinds these kinds of videos that I do but if I were ever in a situation with one-on-one -on -one, I want to consider the students life circumstances so it's a holistic way of teaching i want to know what their daily life is like what their aspirations are what their goals are because it's so easy to give advice and a lot of advice that people give is not necessarily wrong but the nuance is where it's important like for example I heard one person say everyone should learn to play drums I learned to play drums but how many guitar players do you know who can play drums well not many right some people say oh every guitar player should also learn to sing well how many guitar players do you know who can sing really well I'm sure there are some but there are also tons who cannot sing but who still learn to play guitar very well if you think about it to be the ultimate musician, we should ultimately learn to play drums, bass, piano, guitar. We should learn to sing. We should do all sorts of things. But who has the time to do all of those things? So in the end, the difference, what's going to make the most difference is to consider your life circumstances. What's realistic? What's uh, statistically realistic in given your life situation? Those are things that I consider when I teach. With that said, 
I made a long video about this maybe last year. Yeah, I did. A, it's a two-hour video. It's a long one. I don't, some people actually, a lot of people watch the whole thing. But I'll try to. It's kind of a similar video, but I'll try to make it shorter. I believe that a lot of people are wasting their time practicing. And I said this in the previous video. I'll say it again. I'll repeat it here. Now, when you practice, you have to ask yourself why is it that you're practicing. Now, some people just like to touch the instrument, just to noodle, just to do something. Um, it's not even necessarily to get better. It's just playing the guitar for the sake of playing the guitar. That's totally, totally fine. Uh, that's always a good excuse to play or to practice. But if you're practicing the guitar to achieve a specific goal and you're doing certain things that I believe to be a waste of time, well then, you are wasting your time. So case in point, I talked to this guy, um, a really, really good guitar player. And we had this conversation not so long ago. And he told me something that I was, like, I was kind of like shocked. He told me that he's been practicing every day for at least maybe two hours, maybe even more for the past, I don't know how many years, like a few decades. Now this guitar player is good. But practicing two hours every single day diligently after 20 years and not having any signs of visible progress, there's something really wrong with that picture. And that person described to me their practice routine. Yeah, I practice my scales, my arpeggios, uh, my technique and everything. Man, if you practice two hours, your scales and arpeggios, I don't know how you're practicing, but... Um, and nothing's really changed in your playing, you must be practicing wrong. Why are you practicing scales? Why are you practicing arpeggios? Why are you practicing... What very, very specific goals do you have in doing that? Here's an example. Here's this. This is something I have not practiced since I was like 16 years old. Let's say I practice this exercise 10 minutes a day, 20 minutes a day for the past 20 years. Well, I haven't practiced this since I was 16 years old, when I had the little phase where I was interested in Yngwie Malmsteen. Uh, look, I can still play it. Maybe when I was 16 or 17, I could play it a little bit faster, but... <laughs> I think that's still pretty fast after having not practiced it for more than 25 years. Um, continue to practice something that I can do very well is a waste of time. So my, I have the feeling that this person has been practicing roughly the same routine two hours a day for the past 20 years. And it's no wonder that person is not progressing. Um, sorry to say, but that person is deluding themselves. Like, if, if you're going to do that, you might as well not practice because nothing's changing. Again, barring the fact that maybe that person just enjoys touching the guitar for two hours a day. Okay, that's fine. But I think that person was thinking that they wanted to progress. I, I didn't dare say anything to them, but like I just let them say what they wanted to say because I don't think they were ready to hear what I had to tell them because of that deeply held religious belief that they were practicing correctly the truth is it's very easy to progress and progress can happen relatively quickly every year that you practice something correctly you should be able to notice change it makes no sense to practice something for 20 years and see zero change and one of the uncomfortable truths of being able to progress is to put yourself in uncomfortable situations which is why it can be mentally uh, painful to practice because you have to put you in this, yourself constantly put yourself in a situation where you feel like a beginner all the time that's how you progress you have to make things that are uncomfortable to you feel comfortable and once you feel comfortable like really comfortable doing it then you have quote-unquote mastered it you move on to other uncomfortable things and also a lot of people are practicing completely out of context. In the context of jazz music, for example, 
the practice skills, arpeggios. They might even apply them over jazz standards. Again, it depends on what your vision of jazz is. I'm not here to say that there is one single right vision. But let's say they're trying to play bebop. But they practice all their scales, all their arpeggios. Maybe they even practice their bebop scales, but they still don't sound bebop. Why is that? Because they have not worked on vocabulary. They have not worked on listening to their favorite players and acquiring their vocabulary. Or doesn't, you don't have to be a copycat of your favorite player, but you have to understand how the language works. Um, the language of bebop, I said this in other videos, is not scale or mode up and down. It's not necessarily passing chords or anything. It's certain melodic tendencies. <laughs> For example, like that. You have to be willing to try a lot of things. Some things will be correct, some things will not be correct, but you, you have to try it. And you feel, you also have to kind of develop kind of this intuition. Say, all right, maybe I'm spending too much time doing this, it's not really wield, yielding results. It's a little bit of a balance, you know, to find out if when, sh when should results start to appear. I think after a few months, you should start to notice some results and after a few months you're not seeing any results and maybe you it's time to try something else i've mentioned in previous videos that these days i practically don't practice anymore for personal reasons maybe one day i will again but my playing continues to evolve continues to change because even though i don't practice and practicing is important but even though i don't practice i know how to acquire knowledge i know how to absorb music just by listening to it and so when I, I, I know how to listen to music very carefully, and I've talked about this in previous videos, it's related to the book that I just released. I made an ad for that a few weeks ago. It's a certain state of mind. So get this, me, sometimes I go days without even touching the guitar. And the person who's been practicing two hours for the past 20 years, I'm progressing at a significantly faster rate than that person is. So that says a lot it's the same thing with language those of you who know me know that i now live in japan and in order to live in japan which is a society that doesn't speak any other language but japanese um i have to learn japanese just to be able to survive here survive comfortably to have a comfortable life and there were certain things that I had to do that were very uncomfortable to be able to get, to be able to progress. I had to create an environment for myself. And it's uncomfortable because I put myself in very uncomfortable situations where I was in situations where I had to use Japanese despite having zero confidence. And I, I would still say that I don't have full confidence yet, but I have m way more confidence than I used to because I go, got over my fear. And sometimes people also practice things incorrectly just out of the denial, just because of the comfort it brings. So one thing that's very common among language learners, and I see this a lot, is people are using Duolingo. And I think it's not that Duolingo is bad, but I think a lot of people are spending way too much time on Duolingo and it feels they feel a sense of accomplishment if, you, if you've ever used Duolingo it's an app that treats language learning like a game so you win prizes experience points you level up but the truth is um, all these people who are using Duolingo still can't speak the language they're trying to learn to save their lives they cannot isn't that revealing I have used Duolingo as well, but then I, I realized, all right, this is a waste of time. Um, I mean, okay, it's better than nothing, but the amount of time you spent practicing on do studying on Duolingo, you can easily spend that time doing something actually more useful. I, um, I think Duolingo, I'm gonna use the video game analogy. <laughs> My friend, my video game uh, friend sent me a video of a guy who spent 500 hours grinding 
his character to the top level in the first stage of the game. For those of you who don't know how this, these games work, it's often progressive. Like in the first stage of the game, when you defeat the monsters, you get a certain amount of points. Very, very, very little. And so, past a certain point, it becomes super inefficient to continue to what they call grind. If you continue to grind that level, it's gonna take 500 hours. And the game is not supposed to take 500 hours to play. But some guy on the internet did it just for fun, just to be able to be the first person to do that. I feel Duolingo is the same. Maybe you can spend a bit of time, but instead of spending 500 hours practicing on Duolingo, Maybe spend 500 hours doing things at the correct progressive rate. And that's exactly how I learned Japanese. I put myself in the correct situation. And I've talked to some people, you know, who are trying to learn that. I tried to tell them a little certain things, but they don't believe me because of this deeply held belief that they have. They continue to do the things that they do. Until one day they realized I was right, maybe not through me, but through their own realization. And then finally they, they progress. And uh, this kind of deeply religious, religiously held belief, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's an obstacle. And the sooner you can realize this, the sooner you can be on the right path to progressing naturally. And it's hard to know what the right path is, to be honest. I, I fully admit that. You have to watch my previous videos from the previous week because a lot of things depend on our life situation. Everyone is a little bit different. So what applies to one person might not apply to others. But I still do believe that the environment thing can play a huge, huge role. Again, for example, in the context of jazz guitar or jazz in general, I know people who spend hours practicing their scales, practicing their arpeggios, practicing their modes, blah, blah, blah. But they still don't know how to play any song. That's very, very wrong. And those, there's, there's a consistency here. Those who focus on songs, memorizing them, learning the melodies, learning the chords, they tend to progress way faster than those who are not practicing songs. I suggest you watch some of the previous videos from the previous weeks, especially for the ones where I was talking about talent. Some people, I think the super talented people practice the right way, right away. And that's why they can progress really fast. And if you look at child prodigies, check out violinists or jazz guitar players like Birey Lagrin, see how fast they progress because they are, they are not wasting time. They are doing things correctly from the very beginning. It actually you know, there's that study that takes 10,000 hour, 10, hours to master something. I don't think that's true at all. The proof is you have all these prodigies within four years or five years of maybe practicing three, five hours a day. Does that end up being 10,000 hours? I, I'm not sure. You'll have to do the math. Well, I'll do the math later. We'll find out. <laughs> but within three to four years, they become very, very competent musicians. It's about efficiency above all else and a lot of people are not efficient and it's not easy to be efficient because you know you're a beginner you don't know what efficiency means myself included in the beginning and people are practicing things for which they are not at the correct level to be practicing at again watch that video that i where i talked about that a few weeks ago i think it's the talent video i think it was yasha heifetz very famous violinist who said he only practiced two hours a day. I could be wrong, but I think it was him. And I think for him, it's true because he knew how to remove all the BS and practice only the right things. And also because he's super talented, he was able to skip a lot of things that people who are not as talented may have to work harder, twice as hard to achieve. So. In the right circumstances, it's true. I believe that you don't necessarily have to spend many physical hours practicing your instrument if you have the right circumstances. But 
depending on your skill level, your life circumstances, maybe you do have to spend a bit more time. Just to tell you something about me studying Japanese and this environment thing. Okay, I put myself in this environment, but I also take lessons every single day. I have a few hours of lessons every single morning. It costs me a lot of money. Uh, like the others, I talked to some of these language learners. Oh yeah, I have a class, one class a week. Like you have to ask yourself, what is that going to do for you? Uh, why are you even learning Japanese if you don't even live in Japan? Like, uh, one, one, taking a class one, once a week, probably not even practicing every day, is the same thing as practicing guitar once a week. We all know where that gets you. It's kind of like these parents who enroll their kids in all these activities. What a waste of money. I, I, I mean, I think it's true that a lot of parents just want to get rid of their kids <laughs> so they can have a bit of free time on their own. But if they really believe that their kids are going to learn how to play piano, become a hockey player, a tennis player, a champion swimmer, yeah, good luck. The harsh truth is if you want to get good or even decent at something, you either go all in or you don't. Again, that's the specific goal, if you want to get good. It's totally fine to do things purely for the therapeutic reasons, for the fun of it. In which case, yeah, practice once a week. Do it uh, when you feel like it. But let's be realistic. It's not going to get you anywhere. So in the case of my friend practicing two hours a day, what a waste. You might as well just spend two hours watching TV or something else. I guarantee you, it's not getting that person anywhere at all. I know so, because I've seen they're playing. <laughs> so hopefully with this video, I can get you to think a little bit about why you practice, and what it is that you're trying to go for. The more you have a clear goal, the easier it will be to, to set up efficient practice routines. But the unfortunate truth is that to get better, to progress, you have to be constantly putting yourself in these situations where your weaknesses are exposed and then you address them. And when your weaknesses are exposed, there's a little bit, uh, at least for me anyway, a little bit of this feeling of discomfort because you sound like crap. When you practice, you have to go through periods where you really sound like crap. Speaking of these widely held beliefs, here's one thing. I make a lot of these statements, but I can back up everything I say and I tend to avoid saying things where I cannot um, defend my position. I make sure that what I say I can justify but there are a lot of people giving advice out there based on again deeply held beliefs one way or another. So here's one someone actually sent this to me not so long ago I don't have an account on that form, so I can't reply to them, but I'm going to reply to them right here. Maybe they'll see it. Look at this statement. I miss the point. I accept that argument, and I'm glad that they brought it up, but they don't really um, explain what they mean. So they were talking about this video about George Benson picking technique. It's a video that I made uh, this past year. Where I talk about the difference between, I guess, Gypsy Jazz picking and George Benson picking. The thing is, if you look at both topics from kind of afar, you can make very general statements. But if you're like me and you've really deeply investigated the topic, you're going to notice there are lots of variations that it becomes very hard to accurately define because there are tons, tons of exceptions. And so the gist of it is it's gypsy picking is playing with a broken wrist like so, and then playing down, playing, changing new strings with a downstroke. And every time you do a downstroke, it's a rest stroke. That's the very, very simple answer. But as many of you know, I've had the opportunity to work alongside all of the very best living guitar players. Birelli, Angelo, Stokolo, uh, 
Chavo Schmidt, Rafael Faiz, you name them, I've worked with them. All the legends, all the living legends. And I notice that they all have their own way of using this technique and it doesn't always fit the definition, the, the general definition that I gave earlier. And it's the same thing with uh, George Benson Bean, which is a technique that I've worked on. It's actually a technique that doesn't work on these wide neck guitars, but I still manage. Now the person posting that comment, unfortunately, I don't know what technique they use. They don't show. So I'd be very curious to see if they know what they're talking about because sure you can have an opinion of on, on something if on anything but i would rather tend to believe someone who could demonstrate it themselves and i've demonstrated that i can use this george benson pin and, and you can watch many of, of my previous videos where i'm using this gypsy jazz technique i think i can confidently say that i have a certain degree of ability with both techniques so what I'm trying to say is that I noticed that by changing variables it becomes very hard to define certain things because the same thing with George Benson technique they're all um, speaking to Dan Wilson I found out it's something that uh, in a certain part of the USA where George Benson is from in the African-American church community vast majority of guitar players are using this technique we call it George Benson technique because George Benson is the one who popularized it. He's one of the most visible guitar players out there that uses that technique. But if you look at all these other guitar players who are using it, it looks, again, from far it looks the same, but when you look deeply closer, you notice that they all have tiny little variations in their playing. And this is the, the personal factor, which is very important. So technique is... I can definitely teach in terms of like a set of very specific mechanics but depending on how you play like the kind of lines that you want to play the kind of fingerings that you use the technique might have to change a little bit that's where these little variations come into play so in the case for example a uh, gypsy jazz technique look at Stokolo Rosenberg and then look at uh, Jorgi Lefle who have who look like they use the same technique but then when they start to play fast, they use completely, completely different techniques, different pick strokes and even mechanics. So that's my argument. I'd be curious to see what this person has to say against what I just said here. And I also believe that technique should be at the service of music. I don't like technique to be dogmatic. I want people to understand why they're using this technique you don't adopt like 75 degree angle of the wrist without understanding why you do it it's often to achieve a specific result and if you achieve, if you manage to achieve the result that you're looking for with another technique then that's totally fine there you go i'd be curious to hear your thoughts on all of this thank you Leave a comment, subscribe, buy my books, buy something on DC Music School, sounds as I don't know, thank you!